Well, it is uh, so good to be with you. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. Now, a few FYI things. Just as you know, the, the pandemic has uh, kind of reached a, a new level. We uh, are still open on Sundays, two services. We have been thinking of going to three. We're kind of right on that bubble, um, but we decided to, to go to stay with two, running children's ministry at 11 o'clock. And we have separated our children's ministry a little bit. So if you are watching, you have kids and would like to come, our, our little, little guys uh, are there down. We've given them the, our whole basement area just so they can spread out a little more. And our older kids are going out to the portable. And, uh, but we're excited that we can still continue ministry. And there is nothing like fellowshipping with, with God's people. So, and also just kind of FYI, this sermon here is based on Mac or Mark chapter 12. And this is actually a sermon that I did in October 2020. So if you go back in our archives, you'll kind of see this as, as a repeat. The reason for that, well, there's two reasons. One is Pastor John was scheduled to preach today, and he's not like super crazy sick or anything like that, but he is a little under the weather. So we aired on the, you know, just to be cautious. And, uh, and so he, he is staying home. And, and so I needed to quickly get something together. But I had an interest in going back to my last sermon that I preached in Mark because in the coming quarter, in a few weeks, I hope to be going into Mark 13. And so preaching this, this one on the last part of chapter 12 kind of allows me to kind of get my headspace back into Mark. And it's just such an exciting text. So anyways, just wanted to kind of keep you informed with that. But really to start out today, I want to start out by asking you a question. If you've been in Christian circles for a while, you've probably heard the term repentance. But even if you have been in Christian circles for a while, could you explain what that means? You know, I think as a church, we tend to talk about it, but do we really spend that much time thinking about it and what all that means? Charles Spurgeon said this, that repentance is a discovery of the evil of sin, a mourning that we have committed it, it's a resolution to forsake it. It is, in fact, a change of mind, a very deep and practical character, which makes the man love what he once hated and hated what he once loved. So clearly, Spurgeon saw repentance as a, a, a real change, a change so profound that we now we, we love what we once hated and we hate what we once loved. So when we talk of repentance, we are talking about a profound change in our affections. Really, a change of, of what we want out of life. John Piper writes this, he says, Repenting means experiencing a change of mind that now see God, God as true and beautiful and worthy of all our praise and our obedience. But again, a key here is repentance. It's a change of mind. It really begins to see God for who He is. And as a result, hey, there's this deep commitment that I, you know, I got to praise God and, and I got to obey Him. But one question, another one I want to ask of you is why don't people repent? You know, why don't, why don't we repent? You know, why, when, why do we get stuck, right? We, we don't change for the better. We know there's areas in our life that just are not pleasing to God, but why, why are we so prone to just stay there? Why are we prone to love what we are to hate and to hate that which we are to love? And another question, why are some people, even so-called religious people, so content with doing their own thing? And see, that's one of the reasons I wanted to come back to this text is because Mark helps us with that. If you've got your Bibles, your phone, uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 12. I'm going to be reading uh, verses 38 to 44. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. 
And he called the disciples to him. He said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything that she had and she had to live on. Well, before we get into the text, would you just join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would search us. Lord, give us a spirit of repentance, Lord, that desires to change our lives in the, in the areas that need to be changed. Lord, those things that we say or do or think, or, or maybe we don't do that we should do, those things that displease you. Lord, give us a greater desire to, to see our purpose in life, which is to bring glory to you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, so in verse 38, we see Jesus teaching again, right? You know, when I first studied these opening verses, I thought, well, you look at this, this really could be an outline for someone who wants to worship themselves. But, okay, you want to worship yourself, but you don't want to make it too obvious, and you don't want people to believe that you think that life is all about you, but you, but you believe that life is all about you. This could almost be a self-worship 101 course. You know, quickly we see these guys in the text, hey, they're serving God, but they're doing it on their terms. It becomes clear that, oh, they've got a deceived and defiant heart. They've got a proud heart. It's, it's like pride is just like oozing out of these guys. And did you notice the affections of the scribes? You know, what they are wanting. It, it, do you know what really fires a self-righteous person up? Well, look at verse 38 to 40. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the feast who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. So we're talking about scribes, right? We're talking about those who have been entrusted with the preservation and the communication of God's word. Now, I should clarify that I don't think Jesus is saying that all scribes fit this description, but I think the majority of them do. And, and remember, these are people, like who is a scribe? These are people that, oh, if you were to ask them, hey, do you honor God? They'd say, oh yeah, of course, my life is all about honoring God. They're likely guys that were sleeping comfortably at night believing, Oh yeah, my day pleased God to the max. But the reality was, these people, religious people, they didn't desire God. And how do we know that? Well, look at their affections. Look what they're chasing. Verse 38, they're walking around in long robes. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with wanting to look good, right? But these guys, they are extreme. These guys, they want to look impressive. That is their thing. In Jesus' day, wearing a robe like that, it was, it was a way of showing, oh, this is my high status. And as they're walking about, notice they, they like the greetings in the marketplace. Again, nothing wrong with wanting to talk to people. That's a good. But the wording here indicates how, well, you know, they just didn't want to talk to people. They craved it. And they craved it, not just a simple, hey, how are you doing? They craved, hey, I want you to demonstrate how much you respect me. I want you to recognize my prominence. But there's, ver there's more, verse 39. They also wanted the best seats in the synagogue, best seats in the religious festivals. I, mean, I, I think it'd be easy to, to make a case. These guys are entitled. We are talking about self-proclaimed worshipers of God that, that just really, oh, they, I, I'm just going to use my position for privilege. So with these scribes, there, there's this crazy irony going on. Because think about it. Why are they going to the feasts? Why are they going to the synagogues? Right? Why are they doing all that? Well, if you were to ask them, they'd say, well, I'm going because I'm going to honor God. I'm going to worship God. But Jesus is telling us what they really want on the inside. They really want the honor and worship of themselves. And possibly you'd argue that looking impressive, looking for recognition, looking for privilege, well, I get that. But, I, you know, I don't think it's all that bad. But here's what we need to understand. Even though that doesn't appear to be hurting anyone, it goes really deep. If you look at it this way, they're willing to shaft God, right? They're willing to, to, to shaft who made them, their creator. So do you think if they're willing to shaft God that they're going to be willing to shaft people? Of course they are. 
And that is because when pride grips us, we become the center of the universe and it takes us to some dark places. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So for these scribes, look at the dark place that these scribes are at, who devour the widow's houses. Think about that. I, I truly believe that how we handle money is a general solid indicator of what's going on in our heart. It really does reveal what we want inside. You know, one of the reasons for that, and if you think about prestige and control, which is often things that people crave, money's the gateway for that. Hey, if we got lots of money, guess what? We can afford to, to dress really sharp and, and we can afford to look good in front of people. If we have lots of money, we can, oh, we can have a better sense that we are in control of our own future. So commonly, guess what? People want lots of money and they want it for selfish reasons. And if need be, we try, we try gain it at the expense of others. For these men who are the caretakers for, of God's word, greed has consumed them to a point, well, they're going to look for gain and expense of the, for, at, the most, at the stake of the most vulnerable, right? The widows. In fact, they're willing to devour them. They're willing to devour their places of shelter. Again, think about this, right? You're going to take a widow's home to get what you want? Like, who does that? And how did they devour a widow's home? Well, the text doesn't tell us, but clearly these guys are using their position of power to prey on those who need their help the most. But in their mind, it's okay, right? Because I pray really long in front of other people. Again, irony. They say, oh yeah, I'm talking to God. Even that is just trying to draw attention to themselves. So Jesus calls them out. He just tells them how it is. And, oh, yeah, guys, you are going to get something from God. And Jesus assures them it's not going to be enjoyable. In fact, they will receive a greater condemnation. You know, this is a kind of an important point from here. This is that, you know, understand that God in his sovereignty, he deals with injustice, right? But he is God and we're not. So he's going to do it in his way in his time. So just apply that into what we're facing now. If you feel that there's maybe some, a person treating you unjustly, or maybe you feel the governments are, are taking advantage of you, remember, God will deal with it, but he'll deal with it in his way and in his time. And so right now, God is allowing these religious leaders to worship themselves, but God's justice will prevail and they will receive a greater condemnation. So in this passage, we're, we're getting a lot of judgment talk, right? And, and, and if we were to peek ahead in Mark 13, which is where I'm going to be in a few weeks, there, there is, I'm telling you, there is more judgment talk coming. And, and so, but as, as Mark 12, you know, this is like the end of the chapter, the text seemed to take a, a strange twist in verse 41. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sum. Okay, so the conversation has changed. Because we went from a lesson on self-worship 101 to now, now we, we find ourselves in the treasury department, right? We're watching and observing people who are contributing to the temple treasury. So understand that the, the, the treasury is it's part of the temple. It's open to Jewish people. And by design, you could see people give. You could even hear it as the coins were dropped in, right? And, and so in verse 41, we see what rich people. They're, and they're putting in lots of money right into the temple. And, but Jesus and disciples don't just observe the rich people giving to the temple. They also observe the poor, the most vulnerable, a, a widow. And, and we don't know, possibly this widow is, is one that just had her home devoured by the scribes. Look at verse 42. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. And he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. So two copper coins, right? And many have tried to figure out, okay, what, what would this be like in today's currency? And answers vary. But what we do know for sure is that these coins had the least amount of value of any coins in circulation at the time of Jesus. So, this is a small amount of money, is what he's trying to say. 
Now, I should mention that the, the, some of these verses, there's some controversy, right? Like verse 44, all, for they all contributed in their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. So recall that Jesus has just told us that widows are being abused. And now we zoom in on this one widow, a person in great need, but in her poverty, what's she doing? She's giving all that she has, which isn't very much, but it's all that she's got. So at first pass, you look at this and, oh, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a picture of self-sacrifice, something that we should try to emulate, something that we should do. So over the years, commentators use this passage as a, a contrast between the rich person giving, between the poor person giving. After all, Jesus did point out that the rich are giving more in terms of dollar amount, but in terms of sacrifice, not as much compared to the widow. But the problem of turning this text into a lesson about giving is it doesn't fit the context of the text. We need to consider that this whole section, it's about warning, right? It's about judgment. And so now, like, turning the wheels, and, and, and now we're going to talk about sacrificial giving, it just doesn't seem to fit. Also, it's important to note that when Jesus, he, he, talking about the rich guy, never condemns him, right? And, and what about the widow? Does he commend her for doing what? No, he doesn't do that. He just simply makes a true statement that she is giving out of her poverty. So this is what I think is going on, and we can still be friends if you don't agree with me. But as part of God's design, this religious system was designed to help people in need. It was. In fact, widows, along with other people in need, they've got a very special spot in God's heart. And so as part of the Old Testament law, there was provision to help people in need like widows. They are supposed to be cared for as part of their social support system. So with, with that background info, and, and noting that we've just learned that the scribes, are, they're not helping at all, they're hurting, they're devouring them. Now, I think what we're observing here is a broken worship system. And the case in point to this is, we see this poor widow giving her last coins to the temple. Remember, Jesus, who did he say that the temple was run by? Thieves and robbers which means this widow, who is in need, is actually giving her last bit of money to thieves. In other words, the, this, the widow is not the hero of the story. No, she's the victim. And we have another picture of this broken, religious, corrupt system. A system that has duped this woman into giving all that she has by giving her a false promise that this Jew, of this Jewish legalism system that thought, oh, it's going to bring you a blessing. You know, I see this passage as a real-life example of the, des the destroying nature of sin, right? Because sin, understand this, sin by its nature destroys. And the corrupt leaders, well, hey, they're not destroying themselves. They are hurting those or I should say, they're not only destroying themselves, they are hurting those who need their help the most. And, and so this, what this is, this is a look of, this is a tragic look of their broken religious and worship system. I, I see, I think Jesus is angry at this point because the religious system had literally taken her last cent. And I think that fits with where we're going to go in, in Mark 13 because it, you know what's going to happen in Mark chapter 13? Jesus is going to pronounce judgment on this corrupt religious system. But in either case, I think for, I think for a moment of the reckless nature of saying, like being like these scribes, right? Where we, we say we love God. You know, because if you ask these guys, they would say, you love God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They'd probably be the first to raise their hands. But functionally, how they did life, they were actually living as God was accountable to them. You know, there is always going to be chaos. There is always going to be pain when we think we can do life making our own rules. And, and somehow for us, it's just going to work out well. I'm friends with uh, Pastor Peter Charlebar of Downsview Baptist in Toronto. He's a great guy, great pastor. And I remember early into COVID, you know, this has going on for some time, but early into COVID, especially when churches weren't uh, meeting, he often throughout the week would give these updates on YouTube just to encourage his people and kind of connect with them. 
And one week, and I would occasionally tune into these, right? So one week he gave the example that I think really highlights the, because I, I think really what we're seeing here is the destructive nature of a proud heart. And he gave this example that I really think points out the nature of a proud heart. Because Peter lives, he lives in Toronto, he lives in a high-rise condo. And in his building, one night at 3 a.m., guess what? Fire alarm. I don't know what happened, but there's a fire alarm. And so when you hear a fire alarm, you've got two choices, right? You can ignore it, because more often than not, the alarms are false. But if you truly believe that you need to, to heed the call of that alarm, there is only one safe option, and that is to leave your apartment, go to the staircase, and exit the building, right? But, and Peter said, you know, on the night of the fire alarm, he noticed some people, they were trying to take the elevator down. You know, this is escape time, and they're, they're taking the elevator. Now, I do understand that some elevators have a fire mode that they're actually safe in these conditions, but generally speaking, standard practice is, from what I understand, is that you are not to use the elevator during a fire. Meaning you can put yourself at greater risk when you use an elevator during a fire emergency. And this certainly was Peter's understanding. So the night of the fire alarm, you know, people are moving around and there's people waiting for the elevator when they should take the staircase. And, and so when he, when he tells them, hey guys, you, you, need to, you need to take the staircase, they refuse. Why, why won't you take the staircase? Well, you got to understand, we've got kids, we've got pets, and, and you know, to get out of the building with them, it's going to be hard. So the point is, taking the stairs would not be impossible for them, but it would be inconvenient. It would be hard. And the reason I mention that, because really there's only two choices when people heard the fire alarm. Two choices. First is to believe, oh, this fire alarm, it's false. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to stay in my apartment. That's choice one. The second choice is if you believe this fire alarm is true, guess what you're going to do? You are going to exit the stairs because that is the only safe exit in an actual emergency. There is no third option. It doesn't exist. But for those people not wanting to take the stairs, they did make a third option to suit themselves which makes no sense, right? Because if you truly believe there was a fire, you wouldn't be taking that option. Now, I mention that because I, 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 Scripture affirms that a proud heart makes their own rules. And where do these rules come from? Well, they're going to be based on what they want. They're going to be based on their desires. They're going to be based on their affections. See what the scribes wanted? They wanted prestige, right? We know that. Jesus made that very clear. They wanted prestige and they wanted power. So they made their own rules to get what they truly wanted. Is it not true that many people say they believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. But we, we seem to think we, we, can, we can do our own thing, right? We can do life our way. They are believing a lie. A lie that is propped up by a proudful heart. Never forget Proverbs 12, 15, which says, you know, a fool is right in their own eyes. You know, today, this is a series of snapshots of foolish, proud men. You know, think of the irony, back to that fire alarm situation in Peter's condo. Think of the irony. People, oh, they want safety. Uh, yeah, I want safety. But they actually chose the greater danger by getting into the elevator. They said, oh, do you want to be safe? Yeah, I want to be safe but they wanted to enjoy safety in a way that suited them. Does that describe your relationship with God? Oh, I hope it doesn't. But it is easy to say, oh yeah, I want a relationship with God, but our desires for other things and other people are so strong, we're going to end up doing life our way to suit ourselves and not to please God. And I would suggest for some of you listening that life is just not working out for you. Right? Things are just going sideways. And if you were honest, deep down, for all the mess that you are experiencing, you blame God for what's going wrong in your life. But the reality is, you're, you're experiencing the emptiness that, comings, that comes from trying to make your own rules. And the cure is simple, but it is hard. The cure is humility. The solution is a repentant heart. 
a repentant heart that asks God, to, oh, Lord, help me to love what I once hated. Help me to hate what I once loved. A repentant heart that, oh, it wants to see the beauty of the Savior. Oh, it sees Him worthy of our praise, worthy of our obedience. Brad Bigney wrote a great book called Gospel Treason. And he, he shares this prayer request in the book. If, 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 you know, if we want to be done doing life, making our own rules, you know, us pretending to be God, and we want to be done with this feeling of emptiness that that brings, he said this, this is his prayer request, that God will show you more of the beauty of your Savior even as He reveals more of the ugliness and deception of your idolatrous heart. Oh, the lies that we believe. Is there a lie that you have bought into? You know, this is a sad text, but this is a warning for us as well. Beware of the scribes, Jesus says. That phrase actually means not just, you don't just watch out for them, but you be ready to learn from them, right? And what are you learning from it? The reality is we are all prone to make hazardous choices. It is. It, whether, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, you, myself, all of us, we are prone to make other things and other people God. And that's why we can get addicted to porn. We can, you know, we can be addicted to substances. We can easily cling to a bitter heart. We can even be steal from our employer or just be okay criticizing authority. We need to understand that sin is always progressive. See, these religious leaders, they got to a point where they claimed, and they, I believe they truly believed, that they worshipped and honored God, okay? Yet they are planning, at this moment in the Gospel of Mark, they are planning on murdering the Son of God. They have been overcome by their selfish and evil desires, so overcome that they are going to be putting Jesus on a cross. But we know the end, right? We know that something good came from their evil intent. Because when they left Jesus to die on that cross, oh wow, it led to a demonstration of His victory and power over sin and death. It led to the wrath of God being satisfied when Jesus rose from the grave on the third day. You see, Jesus' victory on the cross not only made provision for us to have eternal life, Jesus' pattern on the cross leaves no room for pride. Right? It, it, it really is the Gospels to lead us a lot to a life that enjoys His abundant life today. So please, beware of the lie that pride brings and cling to the truth of Jesus that sets us free. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank You for the life, the abundant life. Lord, the, we know that we have an enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy Lord, He wants to gain control over our hearts and to take us ways that are not just unpleasing to You. They destroy us and leave us with emptiness. Lord, I pray, Lord, that You would just help us to see any lie, Lord, that has taken root in our hearts, Lord, idols that have taken root. And Lord, that we would, we would learn from these scribes' example, Lord, and we would be fearful of sin and pride and self-righteousness, Lord, that we would turn with humble, repentant hearts back to you. If there's someone listening, Lord, that has not turned to you, I pray that today would be that day that they would experience eternal life from just cl clinging to you and calling out your name and asking for your forgiveness for their sins. And Lord, for the ones that are listening, Lord, that have allowed their hearts and their affections to wander, I pray, Lord, that that wandering would be done and that they would turn to you for their sufficiency, for their joy and for their hope and their peace. Lord, so we thank you and we praise you for your word and we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, once again, um, thank you so much for joining us. And again, if you're in the New Hamburg area, we'd love for you to, to join us and uh, to fellowship with us. Anyways, take care.